The following is a presentation of Apologetics Press. The area of alleged evidences for evolution that is proclaimed perhaps the loudest among the evidences is the fossil record. Does the fossil record indicate that humans evolved from an ape-like ancestor? That's what evolutionists boldly claim to be the case. I ran across an image online a few months ago that showed a few ape-like fossils and a brazen statement at the bottom that said, evolution, we have the fossils, we win. Many evolutionists arrogantly believe that the case has been closed. The evidence is in and creation is lacking. Creation has been disproved. The evolution of man has been confirmed, established by the fossil record, so they say. Is that true? Is that what the actual evidence says? First of all, what would we expect to see in the fossil record if evolution were true? If the literal account of creation in Genesis 1 is true, then there should be a notable absence of transitional forms, since God created creatures in the beginning according to their kind. In other words, there shouldn't be creatures in the fossil record or still living that are half pig, half zebra, and there shouldn't be creatures that are half ape, half human either. Instead, if the creation model is true, the fossil record should show fully functional, distinct types of living creatures right when they appear in fossilized form since they were created fully functional. But if evolution is true, if there's been a gradual transformation in kinds of life throughout history over millions of years, there should be evidence of those gradual changes. In fact, there should be billions of transitional fossils linking every known species on earth to their common ancestors all the way back to that single-celled organism that supposedly began it all. And what's more, such creatures should still even be alive today. Evolutionists realize and admit that the fossil record should reveal transitional forms. The problem is that that evidence does not exist. Darwin himself realized that. In The Origin of Species, he said, "...the number of intermediate varieties which have formerly existed must be truly enormous. Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be argued against this theory. The explanation lies, I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record." He recognized that there should be fossilized evidence of evolution if it were true, and yet he knew it didn't exist. He recognized that that's a major argument against his theory. His response? Well, those billions of creatures just happen to not form fossils. But don't worry, even though the evidence is lacking, you can still believe in my theory. We'll find the proof eventually. Guess what? Over 150 years of further research has simply not helped his case. Kate Wong, evolutionist and senior science writer for Scientific American, said in 2012 in response to the Australopithecus setup find, the origin of our genus Homo is based on meager evidence. Things haven't changed in all these years. The late evolutionary paleontologist from Harvard, Stephen Jay Gould, very prominent and famous paleontologist, he said, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages between major transitions in organic design, indeed our inability even in our imagination to construct functional intermediates in many cases, has been a persistent and nagging problem for gradualistic accounts of evolution. He said, paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. Notice that? Characteristically abrupt transitions between creatures? Which model does that sound like, creation or evolution? What he's saying is, you look in the fossil strata and you see ape-like creature, ape-like creature, ape-like creature, and boom, abrupt change, humans. That's evidence of the creation model, not evolution. Gould went on to say, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of the fossils. Now notice, the lack of transitional forms is a trade secret of paleontology. What does he mean by that? 
Well, he's saying hardly anybody knows that the transitional fossils aren't there. It's not broadcast in science classes and textbooks. They're too busy trying to promote evolution in there to show the weaknesses of evolution. If you want to find admissions by evolutionists about the inadequacy of the fossil record in proving evolution, you have to dig into evolutionary literature that almost no one but graduate level paleontologists read, like natural history, where that quote was found. Notice also that he explains that the forms that we've found are only at the tips and nodes of the evolutionary trees. So picture an evolutionary tree with a common ancestor at the bottom and branches springing from that leading to various species at the tips. What he's saying is we've only got fossils of fully formed species, the alleged ancestor as the starting point and the species today at the end point. What's he saying? that there's nothing in between proving that the alleged ancestor evolved into those other species. Separate fully functional species in the fossil record without any transitional evolutionary history, once again, that's evidence for creation, not evolution. David B. Kitts, the late evolutionary geologist, paleontologist, and professor of geology and the history of science at Oklahoma University, he said, Despite the bright promise that paleontology provides a means of seeing evolution, it has presented some nasty difficulties for evolutionists, the most notorious of which is the presence of gaps in the fossil record. Evolution requires intermediate forms between species, and paleontology does not provide them. If evolution were true, the fossil record should abound with transitional forms, but they're simply not there. Seemingly in a state of panic, the evolutionists find a few bones every now and then and are quick to claim that these are the missing links. But every time they make such claims, time and further investigation ends up disproving their own contention. Richard Lewontin, a research professor at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University, according to their website, website one of uh, Harvard's most brilliant evolutionary biologists, he said, the main problem is the poor fossil record. Despite a handful of hominid fossils stretching back four million years or so, we can't be sure that any of them are on the main ancestral line to us. Many of them could have been evolutionary side branches. Notice that they're now just coming out and admitting that they don't have anything that proves evolution in the fossil record. Lewontin says that, uh, that of the handful of fossils they found, which might have to do with humans, they can't be sure that any of them are. Writing in Science Digest, Lyle Watson, well-known evolutionary biologist and zoologist, he said, the fossils that decorate our family tree are so scarce that there are still more scientists than specimens. The remarkable fact is that all the physical evidence we have for human evolution can still be placed with room to spare inside a single coffin. Now, I find that ironic because without transitional fossils, evolution is dead. Well, what's in the coffin? Mariette de Cristina, editor-in-chief of Scientific American, admitted in 2012, pieces of our ancient forebears generally are hard to come by, however. Scientists working to interpret our evolution often have had to make do with studying a fossil toe bone here or a jaw there. Jaw bones, toe bones are the majority of the evidence. Sporadic fossils have the ability to prove evolution? You think that's the case? Nuh uh, as these quotes admit, but that's what they've got to go on, and so that's what they report. Usually, simply a skull may be found, or a thigh bone, or a toe, or a jaw bone. If paleontologists are lucky, they may find a fossilized skeleton that's 40% complete. And from all of this scanty evidence, evolutionists guess and speculate and conjecture to no end in trying to prove that that bone that they found proves evolution. From that scanty evidence, species are named that those isolated bones supposedly belong in. If you were to open a biology textbook and turn to the section on mammals and specifically primate evolution, you'd probably see a chart that looks something like this on the screen, the idea being to help you to see what evolutionists believe to be the family tree of humans, back to some ape-like ancestor. Each one of these boxes represents a species and the period of time evolutionists believe that those species lived in the past, based, of course, on the evolutionary timeline in millions of years. Some have started to draw the chart more as a bush instead of a line because they're acknowledging more and more that each of these creatures didn't evolve into man. So instead of pulling them from the chart, they put many of these species on their own branch of the bush with Homo sapiens on its own, a separate branch. 
And all that does is make it worse for the evolutionary model since this change acknowledges that there are that many fewer missing link fossils which can be used to argue that humans evolved from an ape. We have materials on our website, www.apologeticspress.org, which go through each of these species. I won't wade through all of that in this session due to time constraints. Now, as you have seen in the quotes already, evolutionists admit that they really don't have much to work with. And what they do have can't be used as conclusive proof of human evolution. Why? Well, there's several reasons. One, because each of these allegedly different species have precious few specimen that they even claim belong to those species. Number two, because the specimens they do have aren't even complete bodies, but usually just sporadic bones, a handful of teeth or a jaw, so they can't even know for sure that they're a different species. Number three, because each specimen they find is always susceptible to being completely wrong, the bones being something other than what they thought it was, which happens often. The bones could be the exception to a species, a deformed, a deformed creature, rather than the typical form of that species. A significant reason that these can't be used as conclusive evidence of evolution is because of what's not on this chart. Even if all of these species were on the evolutionary line to humans, it still wouldn't really help the evolutionist case, and here's why. Each of these boxes, again, is supposed to represent a particular species with its own particular traits, traits that make it different from the other species. So in between each species, there should be thousands of other species linking the species that are on that chart. Those species would have transitional characteristics midway between the other existing species. Question, where are they? Where are those species? That's a lot of missing species. And remember, there should be billions of transitional fossils, representatives of each of these missing species, as well as representatives of all other species on Earth. But that's not what we have. What we have are a handful of fossils from individual distinct species, species that already have fully formed traits, as though they were created and planted on the Earth already in their fully formed state, which is precisely what the creation model predicts should be the case. In truth, it seems that the evolutionary community is so desperate to find proof of evolution that they find a bone and, and rashly promote the find through the media as proof of evolution, only to find out later that they were wrong. Some are clamoring for recognition or money. Famous skeptic Michael Shermer explained the process. If you want to get your fossil find published in Science or Nature and you want the cover illustration, you can't conclude that your fossil is yet another Australopithecus africanus, for example. You'd better come up with an interpretation indicating that this new find you're revealing to the world for the first time is the most spectacular discovery of the last century and that it promised us to overturn hominid phylogeny and send everyone back to the drawing board to reconfigure the human evolutionary tree. Training a more skeptical eye on these fossils, however, shows that many of them belong in already well-established categories. He quotes Tim White as saying, Name diversity does not equal biological diversity. Notice the bias that even the evolutionary community recognizes about itself. The bottom line is that the sporadic fossils that evolutionists find simply do not prove evolution. They are incapable of it. Lee Berger, paleoanthropologist of the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, has been in the news a lot recently over his finding the Australopithecus sediba fossils. Writing in Scientific American, he chided the standard practice in paleontology of trying to draw too much information from single, isolated bones. The Sedaba skeletons that he found were more complete than typical fossil finds, even though the Sedaba skeletons are nowhere near being even 50% complete skeletons. He makes the point that if any of the bones he found had been found isolated, as is the typical scenario in fossil finds, completely different conclusions would have been drawn about the skeleton anatomy. He said, Sedaba shows that one can no longer assign isolated bones to a genus. About time. Creationists have been making that point for decades. Bernard Wood, a paleoanthropologist and professor of George Washington University, as well as adjunct senior scientist at the National Museum of Natural History, he said, Berger is absolutely right that isolated bones do not predict what the rest of the animal looks like. Is it likely that many will listen to Wood and Berger 
No way, because the vast majority of fossil finds that allegedly prove human evolution are based on these isolated bones. Here are a few of the bones that have been found over the years that prove how reckless the evolutionists have been in their clamor for evidence. Neanderthal man, very famous missing link fossils, supposed to be a missing link in the chain between ape-like creatures and humans. However, after examining the fossil remains of the famous skeleton, Dr. A.J.E. Cave proved that Neanderthal man was nothing more than an old man who suffered from arthritis. Dr. Cave noted that every Neanderthal child's skull that had been examined to that point apparently was affected by severe rickets. In children, it's common for rickets to produce a large head due to the late closure of the epiphysis and fontanelles. As Eric Trinkhaus, evolutionary anthropologist of Washington University in St. Louis, one of the world's foremost authorities on the Neanderthals, concluded, Detailed comparisons of Neanderthal skeletal remains with those of modern humans have shown that there is nothing in Neanderthal anatomy that conclusively indicates locomotor, manipulative, intellectual, or linguistic abilities inferior to those of modern humans. So it seems that Neanderthal man's anatomy essentially isn't distinguishable from modern human anatomy in any significant way. On top of that, modern human fossil remains have been found near the remains of Neanderthals that have been dated as older than the alleged dates of the Neanderthals. How could modern humans evolve from Neanderthals if Neanderthals date to a time after modern humans came along? In actuality, Neanderthal man is just a modern man, perhaps found a little deeper in the ground, but not proof of evolution. Back in 1891, evolutionists found fossilized teeth, the upper part of a skull, and a thigh bone on the banks of the Solo River in the Dutch Indies and assumed they were from a transitional creature. From these few bones, evolutionists presumptuously drew what they thought the creature would have looked like, calling it Java Man. Wow, you mean you can take a few teeth, a bit of a skull, and a thigh bone and figure out what a person's anatomy looked like to this degree? No, you can't. But that doesn't stop the wild claims by many evolutionists. Over time, scientists found that the leg bone and teeth were actually from a human and the skull cap was from a monkey. A few years after this find, while Java Man was still famous, in 1926, Professor Eiberlein of the Dutch Medical Service, he found what appeared to be a complete skull in the same area that Java Man had been discovered and seemingly like the alleged Java Man skull. Again, the fossil was hailed as more evidence of this transitional creature until time ran a retraction the next year. In 1927, in the retraction, the Smithsonian Institute said that the skull was actually the kneecap of an elephant. No transitional creature here. In 1912, a doctor found a jawbone and a portion of a skull in a gravel pit in England and assumed the fossils were from a transitional creature they called Piltdown Man. From those two items, evolutionists made a skull to show what they thought the transitional creature's head would have looked like. But in 1953, Piltdown Man was found to be a fake, a fraud. The skull fossil was found to be from a modern human. The jawbone was from an ape. In fact, the fossilized teeth had been changed on purpose, filed down by evolutionists, and treated chemically to make them look old. Definitely no transitional fossil here. In 1922, newspapers printed a picture of male and female human-like creatures that evolutionists had drawn based on, guess what? One fossil tooth they had found, which they claim was from this prehistoric transitional creature. Once again, isn't it amazing what you can come up with about the physical form of a creature from one tooth? They called it Nebraska Man. Within five years, scientists had decided that the tooth was actually from a wild pig, not a transitional creature. The remains of Rhodesian Man were found in a zinc mine in 1921 and displayed in the British Museum of Natural History for years. But the fossilized hips had been crushed, which caused the displayers to portray the creature as stooped over. Once again, years later, when actual anatomists examined the fossils, Rhodesian man was found to be merely a modern human being. Heidelberg man, named Homo heidelbergensis, was based off of a single lower jawbone. Pictured on the left on the screen compared to a regular modern-day human jawbone, Heidelberg Man was recognized by the man that found him, Daniel Hartman, to be very human-like, and so he knew he belonged in the genus Homo. According to Donald Johansson, American paleoanthropologist and discoverer of the famous Lucy fossil, Hartman decided to give him a special name and put him in a species of his own in spite of its strong similarity to the human jawbone. 
Mr. Hartman, just because it's bigger, it doesn't mean it's not human. Wouldn't you like to see the wrestler Andre the Giant's jawbone or Goliath's jawbone up next to a normal-sized human jawbone? That may be exactly what we're seeing here. In 1979, what appeared to be a collarbone was found at a site named Sahabi in Libya, and some scientists believed it belonged to a primitive ape man. And after further investigation, the collarbone was found actually to be the fossilized rib of a sea mammal that was similar to a dolphin. You noticing how hard the evolutionists try to find foss transitional fossils? You'd think if transitional creatures ever existed, it wouldn't be so hard to find their remains. Then in the early 1980s, a portion of a skull, just a skull cap, was found near the Spanish village of Orsay. Evolutionists once again were quick to announce that the fragment was from an ancient human child. From that small fragment, they constructed an entire human they called Orsay Man. Later, the bone was conceded as likely being the skull cap of a six-month-old donkey. Handyman, or Homo habilis, is the creature that Lucy supposedly evolved into, a three-foot-tall ape. Once again, evolutionists will construct models and paintings without adequate evidence, grandiosely speculating and conjecturing. A fairly complete fossil skeleton of Handyman was discovered that indicated that this creature was simply an ape and in no way related to man at all. The skeleton of Handyman is just as primitive as Lucy, which is supposedly two million years older than Handyman. If evolution were true, in two million years worth of time, we should expect to see significant progress in evolving towards man. And yet Lucy is just as primitive as Handyman. No missing link here either. What about the elusive Peking Man? In the 1920s and 30s, a few fossils were discovered near Beijing, China. Evolutionists were quick to call uh, the fossils transitional creatures and proof of evolution, dating the fossils from between 300,000 and 800,000 years ago using evolutionary dating techniques. But scientists have found conflicting evidence from the same site. In 1933, several fossils of modern humans were also discovered who weren't supposed to be on the scene yet. Bottom line, evolutionists will never know for sure because within a few years, in 1941, the, the fossils mysteriously went missing. Gao Zing, a paleontologist and member of the working committee to search for the lost skull caps of Peking Man, he said, quote, We don't know where the bones are. They may well have been destroyed, but we have to look. Isn't it ironic that the more evolution is examined, the more its alleged evidence goes mysteriously missing? What about Cro-Magnon Man? What's all the talk about this guy? Is he proof of evolution? Evolutionists claim that Cro-Magnons were the first creatures with a skeleton that they believe looked completely modern anatomically, just like us. Recent genetic research by a team of European geneticists from the universities of Ferrara and Florence showed that a Cro-Magnon man who lived in southern Italy, supposedly 28,000 years ago, was a modern European genetically as well. Okay, if they looked like us anatomically and they were like us genetically, what's the difference? If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, in this case, bleeds like a duck, it's a duck. No missing link here either. Cro-Magnon man is just a modern man. But you notice a pattern. Quick claims that evidence has been found. Time passes, further study and investigation. Retractions have to be made over and over again. You'd think more people would see the pattern and accept the truth. There's no evidence for evolution, but sadly, many people will believe what they want to believe regardless of the evidence. The missing links between the alleged ape-like ancestor and human beings are not available. No wonder in their more candid moments, evolutionists admit as much. Colin Patterson was the paleontologist who served as the editor of the professional journal published by the British Museum of Natural History in London. He wrote a famous book about evolution, and a reader wrote him to ask why he made no reference to transitional creatures in his book. To this he responded, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them, yet Gould and the American Museum people are hard to contradict when they say there are no transitional fossils. I'll lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. You catch that? What an admission. According to Colin Patterson, there are no transitional fossils, not one fossil that can be used conclusively to prove a link between humans and their a uh, alleged ape-like ancestors. Wouldn't it be nice 
if all evolutionists would make that admission and then scrap their bias against God, scrap the theory of evolution along with it, and allow creation back into the classroom where it belongs. Kate Wong, evolutionist and senior science writer for Scientific American, she said in 2012, For decades, paleoanthropologists have combed remote corners of Africa on hand and knee for fossils of Homo's earliest representatives. Their efforts have brought only modest gains, a jawbone here, a handful of teeth there. Most of the recovered fossils instead belong to either ancestral Australopithecines or later members of Homo, creatures too advanced to illuminate the order in which our distinctive traits arose. With so little to go on, the origin of our genus has remained as mysterious as ever. Over 150 years of exploration into the fossil record since Darwin's book, and there's still so little to go on in proving human evolution. Lord Solly Zuckerman, famous zoologist, anatomist, and British scientific advisor, as well as professor at Oxford University, after studying the Australopithecines for over 15 years, he admitted years ago, if man did descend from an ape-like ancestor, he did so without leaving any fossil traces of the steps of the transformation. As we've been seeing, that is certainly still the case. Lee Berger admitted to Scientific American in 2012 that the fossil record is inadequate in showing the evolution of humans. He said, we really need a better record and it's out there. That, of course, is wishful thinking, a blind hope in evolution. How many years of searching have to go on before the evolutionary community realizes that evolution doesn't cut it? The fossil record supports creation, not evolution. Evolutionary zoologist of Oxford University, Mark Ridley, he said, No real evolutionist, whether gradualistic or punctuationist, uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of the theory of evolution as opposed to special creation. In other words, if you want to win a debate with a creationist, don't try to use the fossil record. You will lose. Okay, so why not give it up? Well, because they are firmly committed to a naturalistic explanation for our origin. No God allowed, regardless of the evidence. If there's no evidence for gradual Darwinian evolution, maybe it just happens real fast in spurts. Interpunctuated equilibrium. Ridley here mentions punctuationists. These are evolutionists who have ultimately admitted that the fossil record doesn't provide evidence for the gradual evolution of man or any creature from simple organisms. So instead of throwing out the theory of evolution altogether and admitting supernatural creation, atheistic scientists are suggesting that maybe evolution happens in spurts, not gradually. This idea is known as punctuated equilibrium. I call it magical equilibrium because that's what it amounts to, wizardry. According to this theory, long periods of time go by without much evolutionary change, with just microevolution occurring, which creationists agree with. But then, according to punctuated equilibrium, all of a sudden a flurry of major evolutionary change supposedly occurs, change which happens so fast that there's no time for fossils to form to prove it. You catch that? The problem with this idea is at least threefold. Number one, the theory admits that there is no empirical evidence that such a thing could happen. It's just a wild assertion based on the assumption that there is no God, a frantic attempt to prop up a failed theory. A last ditch effort to brush the creation model aside. There's never been such an evolutionary pro process witnessed. So according to the evolutionist definition of science, punctuated equilibrium is unscientific. It shouldn't be allowed in the science classroom. One could just as easily claim that fairies exist and float around inside our eyeballs. Neither contention has any evidence. A second problem for the evolutionists with this theory is that it admits that evolutionists are backed into a corner in their lack of evidence to substantiate Darwinian evolution. They're giving up on the fossil record. So the goal has now become to ignore the lack of evidence for Darwinian evolution in the fossil record and just wildly speculate that super fast evolution happens. A third problem is that it concedes that the geologic record supports what creationists have always contended should be the case, if creation were true. It admits that the creationist viewpoint has been in line with the scientific evidence all along. The evidence indicates that creature kinds have remained constant since creation, with only small variations evolving over time with strict, narrow boundaries, boundaries defined by natural selection and genetic mutation, remembering that genetic mutations do not allow the addition of new information to the genome. So when fossils appear in the geologic strata, 
They're fully formed and functional species, not transitional creatures evolving between kinds. That's what the creation model predicts, and that is precisely what the geologic column reveals. Evolutionists call this explosion of fully functional species in the geologic column the Cambrian explosion, and they have difficulty dealing with it. Consider the words of the famous evolutionary biologist of Oxford University, Richard Dawkins. The Cambrian strata of rocks, vintage about 600 million years, evolutionists are now dating the beginning of the Cambrian at about 530 million years, are the oldest in which we find most of the major invertebrate groups, and we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It's as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. Not good news for the evolutionists, but evidence perfectly in keeping with the creation model. Atheistic evolutionist Blair Scott, Communications Director of American Atheists Incorporated, said in 2011 in the Butt Scott debate concerning the Earth, Now, if I take the Cambrian explosion on its own, the logical conclusion I would draw is, wow, it was created. Quite an admission. But he went on to say, but the problem is that there's all this other evidence around it that creationists ignore. Well, wait a minute. What evidence do you think he was talking about that creationists supposedly ignore? Well, he had to be referring to all of the standard alleged evidences that evolutionists use in support of their theory. The evidence is in the textbooks, in articles, in science classrooms. The fossil record, vestigial organs, homologous structures, genetic similarities, whale evolution, and so forth, which is exactly the evidence we were looking at in our previous session and today in this session, which we found doesn't support evolution at all. So notice, according to Mr. Scott's statement, if the other evidence is invalid, the Cambrian explosion stands as positive proof of creation. And from what we've seen, the other evidence is worthless in proving evolution. As I've explained in previous sessions, this chart states the fundamental planks of evolutionary theory and the opposing stance that the creation model takes. If any one of these planks can be shown to be untrue, the entire model collapses. But as we've seen, the laws of science contradict the first four planks of the evolutionary model, while the creation model remains unscathed. In the last two sessions, we've seen that the alleged evidence is in support of evolutionary theory when examined a little closer, proved to, in fact, not be in support of the supposed evolution of man from a common ape-like ancestor or in support of macroevolution, embryonic growth, similar physical structures, genetic similarities, vestigial organs and genes, horse and whale evolution, the fossil record, none of these alleged evidences of human evolution can reasonably be used as evidence for macroevolution. These are legitimate issues that stand in the way of naturalistic evolution, problems that demand an explanation. Question, where's the evidence for naturalistic evolution? If it's not available, why are we even talking about it? Why has creation been thrown out when it harmonizes with the evidence? Without a reasonable, rational answer to the problems at the feet of evolutionary theories, supernaturalism is still the clear choice that harmonizes with the evidence. In our next session, we'll look at the last two fundamental planks of evolutionary theory. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the defense of New Testament Christianity. Visit us on the web at apologeticspress.org or call 800-234-8558.